physics is a wonderful way for people to understand the world around them. It can explain how birds fly, why ice freezes, what makes fire glow, just to mention a few things. Now, this doesn't mean that the explanations are always easy and clear. In fact, the explanations can be downright murky for phenomena far from the familiar. Perhaps the two physics theories that are the hardest to accept when you first encounter them are Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. The first one talks about how moving clocks run more slowly than stationary ones and how objects in motion appear to shrink. The second one tells us that no measurement is certain and that probability reigns supreme in the subatomic world. Well, I'd like to tell you that there is some credible debate about these theories and that we scientists have somehow figured out a way to return to the more intuitive physics of the late 1800s, but that isn't true. The simple fact is that relativity and quantum mechanics have been tested countless times and they work. Like it or not, we have to learn to accept these weird predictions are just simply, well, true. However, and this might blow your mind, these ideas are also about 100 years old. Frontier science has actually moved on. What scientists currently think is even weirder still. So let's review a bit what traditional quantum mechanics is all about. It was invented in the mid-1920s and it was exemplified by an equation devised by Erwin Schrödinger, what we now call Schrödinger's equation. This equation explained why electrons had only certain energies and positions when they circled an atom. At its very simplest, the equation explained that an electron could be here or there, but never here nor there. That's what quantum means. There are certain discrete things that are possible and others that aren't. The things that were quantized could be mass, charge, position, or energy. Now, Schrodinger's equation was only a partial quantum theory, and it didn't take into account relativity. What it did was take a proton and assume it was surrounded by a classical electric field. Now remember that classical fields are not quantized. They vary smoothly. However, things changed in the late 1920s when Paul Dirac started puttering around with quantum mechanics. One thing he did was successfully merge quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. Another thing he spearheaded was a way to figure out a way to make a fully quantum theory. He did this by finding a quantum formulation of the electric field surrounding the proton. We call this the second quantization revolution. This just means that the electric field was expressed quantum mechanically and that it joins such things as a quantum description of the location of matter, which was covered by the first quantum revolution. In the ensuing years, these ideas have been generalized to cover all of the subatomic forces, specifically the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and electromagnetism. While each force has a different precise formulation, they are all examples of what we now call a quantum field theory, or QFT. Although each theory has its own interesting peculiarities, I want to talk a little about some general truths of all quantum fields. In modern physics theory, one can picture all subatomic particles as beginning with a field. Then the particles we see are just localized vibrations in the field. So, according to quantum field theory, the right way to think of the subatomic world is that everywhere, and I mean everywhere, there are a myriad of fields, up quark fields, down quark fields, electron fields, etc. And the particles are just localized vibrations of the fields that are moving around. The idea can also explain how particles interact. For example, suppose you have an electron moving along. The electron is a localized vibration of the electron field. If the electron emits a photon, then the quantum field theory way of looking of things says that some of the energy of the electron field sets up a localized vibration of a photon field, which then moves away. So those are the essential features of quantum field theory. Theoretical physics simply imagines that ordinary space is full of fields for all known subatomic particles and that localized vibrations can be found everywhere. These fields can interact with one another like two adjacent tuning forks. These interactions explain how particles are created and destroyed. Basically, the energy of some vibrations move from one field and set up vibrations in another kind of field. Now, of course, actually calculating something with this prescription is really, really very difficult. The math can be, well, pretty crazy. But the basic idea is really very simple. If you look around you, and you have even the smallest ability to think creatively, you can imagine these vibrations everywhere you look. I don't know about you, but I think that's an awfully cool idea.
Particle physics is a mind-blowing subject that really does teach you a ton about the world around you. By smashing two particles together, you can learn about the most fundamental rules that govern the universe. What we call our theoretical understanding of the subatomic world the standard model of particle physics, that actually is a little misleading. It's not a single theory, but rather several theories that are cobbled together. And not all of the component theories are of equal precision. But today, I'm going to talk to you about the most precise theory ever invented by mankind. This is called the theory of quantum electrodynamics, or QED. So just what is QED? Well, from the first term in the name, we can imagine that it is related to the quantum realm. And the second term in the name tells us that it is about the motion and interaction of electromagnetic forces. They say that success has many mothers, and that is true of QED as well. Well, fathers in this case. The first step forward was made in 1928 by Paul Dirac when he successfully wed quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of special relativity. Along the way, there were many other contributors, but the ones who got the explicit credit for the theory were Richard Feynman, Julian Schwinger, and Sin Itiro Tomonaga. They shared the 1965 Nobel Prize in Physics for their insights. Now, all three of these guys were crucial contributors, but it turns out that Feynman's formulation is the easiest to understand. The reason is that he came up with a series of pictures called Feynman diagrams that stand in for the equations, and it makes the whole process very easy to picture. Now, before we get into that in a big way, I should let you know that to do a QED calculation depends on two crucial components. The first is an idea called perturbation theory. I made a video that talked about that in detail, and it would help you if you watched it. But the basic idea is that if you're confronted with an equation that is too difficult to solve, you replace it with an approximate equation that is easier to solve. As long as the correct and approximate equations are similar, you'll get a reasonably correct answer. And if you need a more accurate calculation, you just use a more accurate approximation. The second idea is that every Feynman diagram that you see is really just a pictorial depiction of an equation. I made yet another video that goes into that in a deeper way. But for right now, just remember that when you see a diagram like this, it is actually standing in for an equation. And every diagram has a corresponding equation. OK, so with those ideas out of the way, what we can now do is talk about QED. So suppose you wanted to simply calculate how two electrons scatter when you shoot them at one another. If you have any classical physics training, you'll no doubt think in terms of an electric field pushing the two apart. However, this is, after all, quantum electrodynamics, so we're governed by quantum effects. And one of the big things here is that the electric field is now quantized. Rather than a big and amorphous force field, the electric field is created by a series of individual and discrete photons. Thus, the right way to think about the scattering between a pair of electrons is that the two particles exchange one or more photons. As one electron emits a photon, it recoils, as does the electron that absorbs it. If multiple photons are emitted and absorbed, the outgoing electron trajectories will reflect the contribution of all emissions. Since we don't know in any specific scattering between two electrons what's going on, we can sort of draw it like this, with electrons coming towards one another and then leaving the interaction, with an amorphous blob that indicates our ignorance of exactly what is going on in the collision. However, what we can do is employ Feynman diagrams to show that what the blob represents is actually just the sum of all things that are possible. To orient you, the wiggly lines here are photons, while the straight ones are electrons. We have the situation of one photon exchanged. Then there's the situation where two are exchanged. Since we can't uniquely identify which outgoing electron corresponded to which incoming, there are some other diagrams that really should come into play, but we're ignoring them here. After the simplest two diagrams, things get more complicated. For instance, the photon could temporarily turn into an electron in antimatter electron pair, or, while the electrons are exchanging a photon, one of the electrons could exchange a photon with itself. There are tons of other possibilities. So is there a way to simplify this? It probably won't shock you that there is. Remember that I said that these pictures were stand-ins for equations. So I'd like to draw your attention to the spots where the photons are emitted or absorbed. We scientists call them vertices, and they are key to figuring out which Feynman diagrams matter more than others. It turns out that photon emission or absorption is hard, 
Specifically, each emission or absorption reduces the probability by about a hundredfold. In practical terms, that means we can simply count vertices and get a sense of how much each diagram contributes. The simplest electron scattering Feynman diagram has two vertices. There are no pictures with three vertices that have two electrons in and two out, but if there were, they would happen about 1% as often as the two vertex case. Four vertices would be 1% of 1% or 0.01%, etc. Thus we can see that the first and simplest picture really dominates. All the other and more complicated Feynman diagrams are just far less likely. And that means that doing a QED calculation is relatively easy. You don't have to include all possible Feynman diagrams. The simplest one does most of the job. Now, there are a couple of complications. For one thing, other details of the Feynman diagram can change slightly the conclusion you can draw just by counting vertices. Also, there are several pictures that have four vertices, and each of them adds 0.01%. A final messy thing that must be taken into account is that one needs to be a little careful about how one handles the Feynman diagrams that have what we call loops. So that means diagrams like this, or this, or this. They require a subtle mathematical technique called renormalization, but that's a complication that only experts need consider. I just mention it in case you want to do some reading on your own. So I've told you the basics of theoretical quantum electrodynamics. Certainly not enough to actually do a calculation, but enough to understand the core points. In another video, I will talk about comparing calculations to measurements, but I'll give you the bottom line here. QED is without a doubt the most accurate theory ever devised, agreeing to parts per trillion. It truly is a jewel in the crown of physics.